Okay, let's start. Welcome and thank you for joining this introduction session. I am Tuto, the Director of Partnerships and Events at Mobility Data. I'm based in Paris and you can reach uh, out to me in French, English, Vietnamese, Spanish and Japanese, but I think we have quite uh, the English speaking crowd today. Uh, why I joined Mobility Data, I really, really believe that technology and uh, all the new innovation that uh, we see lately in the mobility sector can actually help us build better communities. So what are we talking about today? I will first take a step back with you and put uh, out there why we do believe that standardization is so important in the realm of mobility. I will also give you a couple of examples of how to standardize and make standardization part of your work. Then we will go through an overview of standard specification, what do they mean, what exists today, and we will uh, have a deeper dive to discover more GBFS and GTFS that we have the chance to host and maintain at Mobility Data. And finally, I will tell you a little bit more on how to get involved. So first, why standardize? Why has it been one of our strongest statement and mission so far? First, we believe that standardization is key in our industry, but also elsewhere to facilitate data exchange and sharing. Basically, uh, it will same as today, I'm uh, speaking to you in English, it's easier than in uh, any other language or to try and do it in multiple languages. So it's the same for data. It's, really easier for organization uh, from different sectors, from different system, public transit system, for example, or in the plane and the train to share common understanding, common standards. Again, not only in mobility, it's the same for construction, it's the same for architecture and so on. Standardization also allows to make sure that we can create tailored solution to meet multiple and different needs based on the same foundation. So the foundation will be the answer to the same questions. Uh, they get the same answer. And based on that, you can build up to localize and personalize your solution, uh, your innovation, uh, your offer to the user and make it easier, basically, because you will not have to go again uh, to answer the same uh, questions. Another reason of why to standardize, uh, either private or uh, sector or entity from the public uh, sector, standardization reduce cost drastically. It reduces the cost of developing and scaling up anything that is IT data related. Uh, Obviously, for example, if you use a spreadsheet, you know that you have different software out there that will allow you to use them and you are not bound to one person developing something solely for you. And it also reduces uh, the global cost of uh, human resources and time in trying always to reinvent the wheel when uh, the problem has already been solved. For people on the private sector who are looking into getting on a more global scale for their operation, standardization reduces the cost of international development. They can use the same system in different cities for different users, all of us, around the world share the same basic mobility need to go from A to B. Also, why standardize? And this one is more human centric. A standardization process will always come with a community, people who use it, people who define it, uh, people who actually leverage it to create innovation. So you can lean on that community for their expertise in terms of modelization and comprehension. Uh, they will always be there to help you solve problems. So it's uh, very much collective intelligence in the making. And they're also here to share best practices. So very much as uh, when we were students, going to the student body, going to other peers and asking how they solved certain problem, it allowed us to be more efficient and focus on different uh, parts of uh, our journey. So all of this is 
a little bit abstract, maybe. So let's see in three examples exactly what's in it for me. That's sometimes the question that I guess asked the most um, at conferences. So let's take three examples. The first one would be a local authority. Let's say, for example, a city using a data standard format for their mobility data for their needs will allow them to make sure that they can come up or implement one single data flow or process to support licensing of mobility services to ingest the report they receive from the mobility operators and globally manage their mobility efforts without having to try to compare apples uh, to oranges, for example. For a local authority, it also ensures that there is no vendor lock-in, so it definitely reduces the cost. Uh, when, it, uh, when they need to come up with dashboards, for example, to understand better the mobility options, the services they're managing, uh, and they can simply also just decide to change operators. And for cities, uh, last but not least, uh, using standards, again, is being part of a community where they can actually share with other cities uh, the best practices in putting together a tender with uh, a data details in it, or how to manage mobility operators. Uh, some cities, for example, in Europe, even share a template uh, for licensing so that it can actually just be copied and pasted and you don't have to, uh, again, reinvent the wheel. Second example, if you're a bike share operator, if you're facing standardization request or request of uh, sharing your information in the same format, then it's easier when it comes to tenders, licensing, reporting, you have one data flow and you export the correct type of data, the correct data set uh, to answer these different needs. So globally, as a private operator, it reduced the cost of your IT system and the burden on your data and operation team. It also allows you to have a faster scale up. So from one city to the other, if the request is the same, you don't need to spend that much time adapting your data team or operation team. And you can focus on delivering the services that the user or the city or the local authority require in terms of number of bikes, for example, or the type of station. Last example, when you're a trip planning app, we have used them a lot, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and you want to ingest or represent a lot of cities, a lot of different operators. Obviously, it reduces the cost of representing all of that information because it's it's in the same format, then it goes into your data pipeline quite easily. Uh, it reduced uh, the cost of globally your operation data and IT team. And then as a mobile app, you can focus on what is important for you to generate revenue, which is travel experience and adding value uh, to your planning app. Again, same as for the operator, it's easier to scale up from one uh, side of the globe to the other. Let's move to how to standardize. So how to make standardization part of your work? The first most important thing that a lot of private companies, tech companies built around product use a lot. And I do believe that public entities, local authorities should start with uh, the, uh, should start the process the same way define your use case. What are you trying to solve? Uh, what is actually the question you want to answer? Based on this question, on the definition of your use case, then you can start exploring what exists out there in terms of standards, uh, specifications, and select the one that you think will more probably uh, respond to uh, your need. Once you made your shortlist, a little bit like hiring someone and a short list of candidates, you explore the documentation, you reach out to the community to make sure that you try and get a better understanding of what it entails uh, and how the standard can be leveraged. Then if 
you had, for example, a shortlist of two or three different standards, then it's when, based on your research, you refine your choice and you can start exploring the entire ecosystem that, and tools that always come with any standard. So the same as uh, some of us are quite familiar with ISO standards, you will always have companies, consultants, uh, guidelines to help you actually uh, unfold ISO standard, any system, any standard is very much the same. So it's all about getting started. Now, if you want to be part of a standardization process, it starts with joining the community. A lot of standards, even the ISO one, actually do have an open community, more often than not right now on the web. It could be on GitHub, it could be a forum, it could be even uh, a web page, kind of a blog, LinkedIn, something. Or, or it could be a shared drive with different documents and folders. It could be something very collaborative, like uh, a Wikipedia-based, uh, let's say, type of resources. Then once you join the community, you can explore all the different conversation that is happening and select the one that are the most relevant for you. So either they apply to some of the questions that you have defined earlier, or you have a peculiar expertise in that one. So in that case, then you start by uh, reading everything that has uh, been done so far, and you can compare it with your different perspective on the question uh, and start contributing to the documentation, the uh, development of extensions, the tools, and so on. Usually a community built around specification mostly always welcome new people in. and if you have the right to vote, either in a formal standard like ISO or uh, an open specification, please do so. Uh, it's always uh, very nice. Now, uh, let's dive a little bit into how at uh, Mobility Data, we have applied a standardization process for one of our specification, GTFS, that I will give you more details about a little bit later on. So usually we receive an idea through the community channel. It could be a message on our Slack community. It could be on GitHub. It could simply be an email that we receive. We have a look at it and we first confirm if it's within uh, our organization scope or not that I will mention uh, later, uh, which is basically, does it serve passenger information? If yes, then we enter an exploration phase. We ask our members, we ask the industry, so it could be formal or informal survey, us going to conferences and asking questions to see if it actually fits a current need of the industry. If yes, then we go to the next uh, point of the process, which is building the proposal, uh, issuing a first draft uh, thanks to our data analyst uh, and modeler. And based on that, we will open it to the community for the feedback loop. So the conversation I was mentioning earlier where people can give us comment, uh, tell us what something we have forgotten, like every single uh, public transit system has its specialty uh, to make sure that what we propose, the solution, actually can adapt to uh, most of the system. Then when we feel that there is quite a consensus that is reached, that most of the issues and the questions have been answered, it's when we push for an early adoption. And for that, we ask for the commitment of one data producer. So for example, a transport operator uh, and one data consumer. So it could be either a company having a dashboard software for a city. It could also be a trip planning app, uh, as simple as that. and. Uh, we will ask them once they commit to share part of the data set with the community for feedback for actually the entire community to have a look at how would that extension look like and is it feasible or not within the data pipeline, within the IT systems and so on. If we feel that it is feasible, then we open a vote and if the vote is uh, approved, uh, all is well, then it's when an extension is adopted. Any questions? 
So how many um requests how many requests do you get per um per month for um for changes and how many do you have to work through? So we can receive in the good month, let's say, up to ten requests. Wow. Which yes, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, every public transit network is always good at telling us, oh, but my case is very special. <laughs> yeah, can I imagine. Uh, and actually going through them is quite an interesting exercise for us because more often than not, it's when we realize that people have not seen some of our work. So part of it. For example, it exists already, mm -hmm. uh, a way to uh, model it. So then we, we will reply in that. And in terms of how many projects we do pick up, we try to make it between two and four per year, depending mm -hmm. on how big they are. So for example, for 2022, we have decided to tackle flexible services, so on-demand service, demand responsive transit, taxis, modeling, and uh, the representation of fare information. Mm. And these two big buckets actually took all of our year 2022 because they were harder to uh, they, they were harder to make sure that we can have consensus among the community. So, for example, for fair information, I think, like even between uh, Sydney and Melbourne, there are different ways of calculating fare on a transit system mm -hmm. yeah. between the <laughs> different mm -hmm. type of buses, where they go, the service area, and so on. So, you can imagine that us trying to do that on a global scale was. Um, a little bit of a challenge. Ah, sounds amazing. <laughs> it, but but we love it. We learn even more. And for the flexible services, when we started discussing with uh, uh, taxi unions and TNC companies like the Lyft and Uber and transit agencies who were doing uh, demand responsive transit for a very specific uh, area, uh, rural or semi-urban. That was a completely pers different perspective on mobility services altogether. So it took us quite a while also to solve that. Wow, fantastic. That's, a, that's great. And I hadn't realized that was the process actually for updating. So that's amazing. Thank you. You've already learned something. <laughs> great. <laughs> so with that, uh, I've been using uh, in my entire presentation the word specification and standard. So I thought it would be good to share with you what are the differences starting from the definition and then building throughout the ecosystem. So first, a specification is something that enables the exchange of information in a way that ensure that all parties agree on what the information represents. So if we go back to my previous analogy of a language, that would be English dictionary. So it exists out there. There are clear definitions of every single term. So we know what they mean. And when we speak uh, to another person, we suppose that they also understand. So. On top of that set of definition of rule, a specification always has a set of rules. So again, going back to the uh, analogy of language, it would be your grammar, your conjugation uh, in English, and also best practices to refine the interpretation. We have all gone through that in school. You have a lot of exceptions in grammar, and that word would be referred as best practice uh, in the technical world. A specification is not only for uh, data, it's not only for mobility, it could be a little bit more technical. So, for example, we have a lot of uh, specification around the world for construction, like the construction guides in a specific region or country, for example. Uh, it could be functional, the way that uh, most hotels in the world define the check-in to check-out journey. It has it's a specification, it's, it has been standardized uh, throughout the years and so on and so on. Now, what, what makes a specification a standard? A specification becomes a standard or is by default a standard when it's designed, developed and endorsed 
by a standardization body. Uh, I mentioned them quite uh, earlier this session. For example, ISO that everyone know is a formal standardization body that define standards. Standardization body can be found at different geographical level. Um, you can have them at national level. So I'm pretty sure in Australia, you have uh, your one um, standardization body. You can find them at a regional level. So for example, in Europe, uh, we would have the European Normalization Committee that overview the entire region of Europe. International uh, best example would be uh, ISO. The governance of specification and standards. The, this is where they start becoming a little bit different. A specification is governed by a community that was built around it or that helped shape the specification. It uh, is the community is governed by a governance documentation, usually hosted by the maintainers. So, for example, for GBFS, that I will give you more details about later. Uh, as the maintainer of it, we created or we actually wrote down a set of rules that was unspoken in the community. So who can vote, for example, usually the entire community, but how an adoption is decided is full consensus, is majority, is it a two thirds majority, all of that is written in the governance documentation for a standard now, because it is so strongly uh, built and endorsed by a formal standardization body, a standard is governed by a treaty. So in the European uh, Union case, for example, it's always a European regulation that define a European norm, a European standard. The governance process is very formal same as for specification uh, and established by the standardization body. The difference in the governance uh, also is who can vote. Only members of the standardization body can vote. So uh, for example, if I take this uh, example, for example, uh, if we look at the European Union, member states of the European Union only are invited to vote, though the entire community of experts, people who help to define the standard can be wider than just the representative of the 27 uh, state members. And same as for a specification, a vote, can be considered as uh, uh, that it has passed either on majority or consensus. Again, it depends on the rules in the rig of the governance process. Let's have a look at uh, an ecosystem. So this is a standard ecosystem uh, that is used in Europe for mobility uh, information. And it's actually based on a data model, trends model that was defined by the European standardization body. Based on that conceptual model, they define several standard norms that can be used uh, for static information in the case of NetEx, dynamic information in the case of Siri, and observe information in the case of Oprah. So you can see it as really strongly formalized, and that's also because or thanks to uh, the treaty that actually govern these standards. In the case of a specification, if we look, for example, at the GFS uh, ecosystem, the one we are currently right in, it's the entire community that comes together. So I hear a couple of logos, but way more than that. I think we have over 500 organizations in the community, and they're the one who decided together what should be the governance of the specification, how to be uh, used, how the implementation is defined, and also they make sure that the community stays alive by always reaching out to other organizations. And this ecosystem gave birth to two specifications that I will detail later, general transit feed specification, GTFS, general bike share feed specification, GBFS. In our current world of mobility, information, and services, you can see that it actually, uh, ah, uh, sorry, yes, I'll take your, uh, your question first, uh, Paul. So observed information is, yes, essentially a historical uh, record. So it could be two things. If you have static information uh, that is 
changing. So for example, uh, in winter, you have a way of running your bus system. And in the summer, another way of running the bus system, for example, due to heavy snow, uh, then his uh, observe information will be the collection of these two feeds to compare, uh, to allow analysis and comparison of operations, for example. If you look into dynamic data, uh, observe information would be a collection of the dynamic data at a certain frequency. So it could be, for example, every day or every hour or every month, depending on how, uh, how much data you want to collect. And then based on that, uh, you would use what is considered, so observe information to build analytics with uh, static data. So for example, uh, it's used a lot to uh, build analytics on how well uh, a transit uh, system is run. So answering a question that a lot of users find interesting is, is the bus always late at stop ABC? Uh, and that is based on observed information because if the timestamp of that same bus every day at that station is late, then you know that actually it's the schedule that is wrong and not necessarily the driver or the bus that has a problem. I hope I answered your question, Paul. So Oprah has been defined uh, mostly in Europe. I'm not sure that it's in use in a DOT. Uh, for that, I would have to ask question to people who know, but I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. I think uh, Oprah is still very much in the European ecosystem. So it's actually a good segue to this current slide that you see uh, of the different standards specification that exist today in the small realm we are in of passenger information and mobility services uh, in more often than not the urban context. Uh, so the uh, on the slide, uh, you have something that was drafted by the French Institute of Mobility earlier this year, when they actually wanted to see what exists out there. And you see that coming from different perspectives, uh, coming from different needs, uh, there are a lot of different standards and specification out there classified by actually what they do. And our focus today uh, and at Mobility Data is very much the descriptions of transport supplies. So not the booking, not the payment, not the user management. And in that uh, tiny box in the world of standards and specification for mobility, uh, I will give you more details on GTFS and GBFS. All good. So let's dive into GBFS. Before I start with GBFS, another little poll for you. How is your knowledge on GBFS, one being low and five being an expert. Great. I thank you for your answers. So what does it stand for? GBFS, General Bike Share Feed Specification. So shared mobility services, it could be shared bike, for example, or the free floating scooters that we have seen popping here and there on the street. Uh, GBFS was designed as traveler centric. So it's not designed to be operational data. It, uh, it's not designed for operators to uh, do the, the back end of the service. It's not designed, for example, to handle user account because that is too sensitive. So based on that, because it's traveler centric, uh, GPFS is designed, was designed and still is uh, for trip planning. So in 2010, the, we started seeing the first bike share system emerge in uh, cities across the US, but also in Europe, uh, in Australia, I'm uncertain when they started, but I've seen a couple of them. Uh, in 2014, Mitch uh, started drafting GBFS as a way to represent these services. He himself was the owner of a bike share uh, operation system in his town. 
In 2015, he started talking with some of his peers and the trade association in North America for bike share operators who decided to endorse this data format, finding that, again, it's a good idea to standardize and share the knowledge and build on it. So it's how GBFS version one was born. Throughout the years, it got implemented, it got extended. And in 2017 is when we actually saw a lot of these free floating scooters a little bit everywhere. Some were electric, some were still push scooters, so uh, human propulse as we like calling them. And we, the community realized that uh, GPFS could not be maintained only by Mitch uh, and his associate that was too much work for them, especially uh, running their own company. So NAPSA, the trade association, nominated us as uh, the governor uh, and also the technical expert to help improve GBFS. Uh, it's when we launched the version 2.0, yes, NAPSA for North American Bike Share Association, yes. So in 2020, we released a GBFS version 2.0 uh, that added multiple improvements like protection of privacy, uh, more, uh, the, the more a finer way, sorry, uh, to describe uh, scooters uh, and bikes and systems and so on. And earlier this year, we became the official maintainer of GBFS in the sense that as uh, Paul mentioned, uh, NAPSA, the North American Bike Share Association, uh, their scope is really North America, and we all have seen uh, bike sharing and scooter sharing around the world, globally. Uh, there are even talks about setting a system in Tanzania right now, so that's why they needed uh, a maintainer that had a bigger footprint around the world. How is GBFS governed? always very important for an open specification. For GBFS, any stakeholder, so you are a bike share operator, a city, a local authority, can actually suggest an extension or modification. So send an email to us, for example, or join the conversation on Slack or GitHub. And any stakeholder that is important can call for a vote. So for example, if an operator comes up with an idea of an extension, works on it, uh, suggests how to represent a new type of service, they can also simply give the open the vote uh, and share it with the community. They don't necessarily need us to do the vote opening for them. So it's still very much an open source community. Who can vote? Any producer and consumer, and what is different with GBFS compared to uh, GTFS is a city can vote because in some parts of the world, uh, cities are the one who actually uh, are the final host of uh, the bike share system. So you will have, for example, uh, Vélib in Paris that is uh, officially a brand of the city of Paris and operated by several uh, private companies. A producer, when they vote, they can also veto, say that they disagree, it will block the entire extension process. A veto can be because they think that the modeling is not good enough because it does not apply specifically to their use case or simply because they think that it will be uh, too complicated to go with uh, that extension as of today. Once there is consensus in the community. Uh, a proposal becomes part of a release candidate after the vote is opened and closed. And for a vote to pass, we need at least three positive votes, including one from a producer and one for a consumer. It's important to have both represented so that it makes sure that the data can be produced and consumed. So we go on both ends of the data pipeline. And that is, again, no veto. And for a release candidate that has been approved by the committee to become fully adopted, we need to see it out in the wild uh, to make sure that it actually works, it, uh, uh, IT system can actually process it. Throughout the years, uh, GBFS has changed and has evolved 
quite a lot. Uh, again, as I said, to adapt to the different needs of the um, industry, its scope extended. It started with bikes and now it encompasses way more, so scooters, for example. Uh, we also worked a lot on clarifying the specification uh, to make sure that the English language that was used was consistent, but also easy to understand for people who are non-native. Uh, and we added uh, more information to be represented in uh, GBFS. So that's what we call extensions of the specification. We, throughout the years, we also created or stabilized the governance process the rules were unspoken. We simply put them in a document and make sure that everyone agreed with them. Uh, we started a versioning process to keep track of the different ver uh, version and extension of GBFS and best practices to support, again, the interpretation of the specification. Around the community, Mobility Data was uh, very happy to make sure that we listened to the industry needs, uh, to how they wanted GBFS to evolve, and any conversation, we make sure that they stay alive as much as possible. So today, what are the main functions of uh, GBFS? It describes the current state of a shared mobility system. So in any trip planning app that support consume GBFS, the traveler will be given real-time travel advice with the description of vehicle and station location, uh, the availability of vehicle and dock, if you have a docking bike share system, for example, uh, the station status, if it's full or empty, so for a rider, so you don't go to that station in to end your trip if uh, you know that is actually full. Uh, and some uh, business rules such as tarification and information on, for example, hours of operation and so on. And we have seen more and more cities that are using GPFS to describe their shared mobility services. With a couple of screenshots. I'm sure you have all experienced that. Uh, if you wanted to take some uh, shared mobility uh, services through an app, so all of this, the backbone, the language behind it would be GBFS. Who is using it? I was saying more and more cities. We have over 470 systems that are not necessarily cities. So sometimes it's uh, an interurban area with a, a collection of cities, smaller towns uh, in over 40 countries. And yes, you are totally right, Paul, uh, Lime, Neuron, and so on. They use this standard. That's also why on the map, uh, you can see a lot of purple because uh, Lime is quite extensive in their global footprint. GBFS core areas, really what it describes. So the system that would be the name. So for example, uh, Lime that Paul mentioned, the operating hours, uh, can you use it at night or not? Uh, are there days that no service is available and so on? Uh, you will have also description of stations if it's a system they use stations. Stations can be virtual. I um, don't know if it exists in the city where you live in, but for example, in Paris, out on the pavement, we see more and more paint actually on the pavement where you can drop the scooter to make sure that it does not pollute uh, the sidewalk. So that, uh, that those blocks uh, of paint on the pavement would be considered as virtual station. A scooter must be dropped there or picked up from there. You have also in GBFS a description of the vehicle, uh, its rider capacity, if there is a battery or not, uh, sometimes for scooters if it's three wheel or not, if it has a cargo capacity for a bike and so on. GBFS in its core area will also help you give travel rules. So for example, if you're in a certain uh, area, if you can go outside of that area, if yes, how far? Is it 30 kilometers from downtown? Or is it only in a specific area? Can you only use a bike lane and so on? It will give you information of pricing per minute per kilometer, uh, based on a user account, uh, a mix of all of the above, and so on. Uh, and GBFS will also give you details, well, alerts, actually, about the system. So for example, if there is 
heavy snowfall, uh, the system will be unavailable because then it's too dangerous to bike. As I said, GBFS extended its modes. Uh, it's now used to describe bike share services, uh, scooters, free floating, moped, and also car sharing system. All of it, regardless of its uh, human propulsion, electric, gas, you have it all. And yes, Paul, for uh, the city of Paris, uh, we have seen, unfortunately, a lot of uh, users uh, riding scooters on the sidewalk, creating a little bit of difficulties because in Paris, our sidewalks are very, very narrow. Uh, however, the city and the micro mobility operators are currently in discussion to find ways to actually balance the no we don't want scooters but users want it uh, and how to mitigate the the situation so uh we'll see how it goes i'm pretty sure the scooters uh, will not disappear the size of the fleet might be reduced and they might enforce more uh some safety rules such as wearing a helmet using a bike lane getting a fine if you use a sidewalk or maybe they might even reinforce uh, checking the age of the rider, making sure that they're at least uh, 15. That's when we uh, take a first uh, exam for uh, the driving code in France. And yes, it does offer a lot of potential learning for other jurisdictions. That's, that's the beauty of the community. You can reach out to another uh, city having the same issue uh, or facing the same challenges and see how uh, they came up with a good solution that could be implemented. And if several cities decide, for example, to be stricter on the travel rules for sidewalks or bike lane, on our side for GBFS, it would mean maybe adding a field for people to describe that in a finer way uh, instead of a general message box, for example. GBFS, if we dive a little bit into the code, is uh, written in JSON, which is a JavaScript object notation. It's very lightweight. Uh, it's an easy way to uh, exchange uh, data in between operators and system. Uh, and it has been used a lot to store other type of uh, information and to exchange them. As you can see on the right, it's very easy for human to read, even if uh, you're not uh, a programming expert of a, or a software developer. And obviously, it's a programming language. It's very easy for machine to actually pass and generate. As of today, uh, the structure of GBFS, it's a collection of 13 files uh, that has a combination of around 150 fields to describe all shared mobility services and their attributes. Some are required or not, uh, depending on the type of service you run. So I mentioned earlier stations. If you have a free floating system with no station, then you don't need those files. Uh, the file can also be referred to as endpoint. So when you enter a conversation and people are talking about endpoint, 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 then they mean a specific in the feed. As I said, uh, a lot of different versions of GBFS were created uh, since its first draft in 2014. So to know in which version you are when you open any file in the GBFS feed at the very beginning from version 1.1, you will actually see the number of the version. So here, for example, it's 2.3. If you don't see that line, it's safe to assume that it's 1.0, though that version keeps on being less and less used because it dates a little bit. Thierry, good question. Uh, so Thierry has asked in the chat if there is a de jure standard equivalent to uh, GBFS specification like Netex to GTFS. Actually, uh, Netex and Siri have been extended to new mode to cover uh, what GBFS covers. Uh, there was a mapping we released jointly with uh, the Data for PT team. So the experts of Transmodal, Netex and Siri in March this year, and I believe they actually have a webinar tomorrow at 9.30 to give you an explanation on all of this extension of Netex and Siri for what they call new modes. 
the latest version of GBFS was launched earlier this year, and uh, it was actually built with the French community of uh, car sharing operators. So that's actually with their support that we answered the different challenges of modeling their operation while making sure that it's compatible with the way that uh, bike share operators see their operation. So as you can see, now GBFS fully supports car sharing, but it got finer in describing the station, uh, what kind of charging ability it uh, they have, important for any electrical vehicle, but very important for cars. Uh, the drop-off restriction, so it goes a little back with uh, your uh, comment uh, and question, Paul, about uh, the city of Paris. We gave the community a better way to describe where, for example, scooters or bike could not be dropped. So, for example, on a sidewalk, that would raise an alert on uh, the user app on their mobile phone saying that they cannot drop uh, the the bike there, obviously the GPS signal is not perfect. So more or less 10 meters. Sometimes you see them on the sidewalk to really close to the parking area. We also added a vehicle icon and brand information as on the screenshot on uh, the, your right. Uh, it's, it was easier for people to see it uh, with a little logo uh, where uh, the vehicle is. Uh, we also added hold times that are interesting, for example, for a station-based system. When a user see a bike that is available at the station, they might need to walk for five, six minutes to get to the station so they can hold that bike uh, to make sure that they get it when they reach the station and there is no frustration when you arrive at the station, someone else already rented it. And because of car sharing, or thanks to car sharing, we got uh, a better description of the different pricing plan per vehicle type. So if you take a certain type of car, uh, the pricing could be different. For example, it is also true with the recent surge of electric vehicles. So an e-scooter sometimes is uh, more expensive to rent than a classic scooter. And we updated the terms and privacy policy, mostly uh, under the impulse of uh, GDPR compliance in Europe. As I said, GBFS is an open specification. It was built by a community, around a community, so it also came with open source tools. Uh, I'll give you an overview of these open source tools. The first one is one that I believe is one of uh, our most important ones. It's the documentation platform. It's the one place where you can find all the reference for GBFS, the actual definition of terms, uh, so the dictionary, if you want, uh, but also all the details on the current change extensions we're working on. You will find the details of the governance process, who can vote, how the vote happened, how long it stays open for, and so on. And you have on that same platform the list of all the tools, some of them that I will present today, different guides, for example, for cities, if they want to have some language to copy and paste in their tenders, in their uh, call for interest, in their licensing terms, and also articles and white paper around shared mobility in general, and any document that we felt was relevant to a bike share operator or a city wanting to implement uh, shared mobility services. Another tool built for GBFS is uh, the canonical validator. So what is a validator? It will allow you to define if the feed you receive in GBFS is valid or not. Uh, does it contain the file that are required? Are the field uh, properly described? So for example, if one field uh, for tarification uh, require numbers only and it's filled with I don't know, a text, then the validator will flag uh, the feed as not correct. So that's what a validator does. It's kind of like you can imagine it like uh, some uh, traffic light system with green, orange with some information that might be inconsistent and red when it does uh, not work. So that's what a validator does. Why do we call it the canonical validator? It is because it's based 100% on what there is in the specification, no deviation. Uh, our validator is also free and open source, uh, so anyone can have access to it. Uh, you will find 
uh, on the slide link to access online and also directly on GitHub if you want to uh, put it as part of your data pipeline. Uh, obviously, when I will share the slides after the event, you, you will have access to these direct links. Uh, the validator was not built by us it was built by one of our member fluctio they donated to us because they wanted to make sure that the tool stays free to use and open source since then we have been working with them and other contributors of the community to maintain it with every the, the specification every time it changes another tool built for gbfs is the data set catalog so it's a giant repository uh, that lists all the GBFS feeds that are public and that we know of. So it's not exhaustive, but it is the source that I used uh, to show you the map of GBFS implementation earlier. Uh, and it's a result of a community effort. So it's hosted by us, but anyone actually should uh, and can add uh, a link to their GBFS feed when they create it, when they make it public and available. Uh, so people can actually know that a new system exists, for example, or has been created or has started. The last update was four days ago. So you see that the community is quite uh, alive around it. Now, other things built using GBFS, other specification were built on top of GBFS. As I said uh, earlier, GBFS is very much user centric, traveler facing. So there was uh, a need for an additional layer for discussion between operators and cities. And it's when MDS was created by the Open Mobility Foundation. Another specification that builds on top of GBFS, this one is a little bit more European centric. It's TOMP API, it's an open specification that allow discussion between transport operators and mass providers to ensure a seamless journey for one user from the trip planning. So that is the part described in GBFS, where is the bike, uh, down to payment uh, on the entire journey. So. Um, and that is uh, actually quite useful if uh, you're using a different app than the one provided by the operator or for a multimodal journey. Also built using GBFS, analytics and dashboards. So any of you who uh, actually are interested in the how many shared mobility system there is uh, in your area, in your country, uh, around the world, uh, that would be built based on GBFS feed analytics, obviously not only, it has to be crossed with other type of data, but it gives you insights like the one here on uh, which is the country with the most riders, for example, in uh, as on scooter sharing. It uh, also opens the door to cities having dashboards uh, where they actually see where are the all the shared mobility vehicles in their street. It can be combined with weather, other type of data for the city to better manage their mobility options. Good question, Paul, on how GBFS and MDS are related. You can really think of them as a, a Russian doll, if I may say it. GBFS is the core for the description of services that are traveler facing, so description of service, station, vehicles, and MDS add several endpoints on top of it that are more specific to the city. So, for example, the percentage of downtown uh, of a system, uh, uh, more details on the trip taken by the user, so the city can actually get a better idea of the flow that they get in the city for bike sharing system, uh, and so on. So let's dive into GTFS, so more for public transit. So GTFS, what does it stand for? General Transit Feed Specification, same as GBFS, it's traveler centric, not operational, and it describes transportation network information. Again, uh, it was designed for trip planning. This one way before GBFS. Bibiana started drafting GTFS in 2005. Uh, she works for TRIMET in uh, Portland, Oregon, in the United States, and it got picked up 
uh, by Google uh, in the sense that they were adding features to Google Map uh, based on that first pickup and the first iteration of the draft, a bigger community got created and there was a need to uh, come up with a governance framework on it that was uh, done in 2008. Uh, in 2010, GTFS was officially renamed the General Transit Feed Specification and in 2011, uh, the, there was the creation of real-time information. 2013, a lot of people were using smartphones or demanding more services out of their smartphones. We have seen the rise of way more trip planning application. And it's when the entire community realized that uh, people were understanding GTFS differently. There was a need to clarify how to actually use GTFS. So in 2015, the Rocky Mountain Institute in the US hosted uh, a project that is called GTFS Best Practice. It grew bigger up to the point that mobility data was incorporated in uh, 2019. And in 2022, today, the community is so much alive that multiple extensions have been created, including, as I mentioned earlier, uh, FAIR's representation. How is GTFS governed? It's very much governed the same as GBFS based on a community where everyone, any stakeholder, can suggest a modification or an extension. They can work on it or they can ask us to work on it. Uh, if they work on it themselves, they can open a vote anyone can do it. Uh, if there is a veto, then again, it blocks the entire adoption process. For a proposal, a suggestion for modification to be adopted, that is important, same as GBFS, data must be produced and consumed to make sure that IT system can actually work with it. Uh, and we also need to make sure that there are three positive votes in the community with at least one producer and one consumer, and then there is no veto. So good question. Uh, who is invited to this voting session and how does it play out? The, in, the vote is open on GitHub because it's where the open specification is hosted. And anyone who has a GitHub account or can log into GitHub can vote. Uh, the vote is usually open for a week to make sure that we give enough time to everyone who is involved, regardless of their time zone, to cast a vote. Uh, and throughout the voting process, mobility data, if we have your email, if you are on a Slack channel and so on, we will keep on sending reminders that the vote is open. So. Hint, I don't know if you are already in the GitHub community. If not, feel free to send me your email. We will send you an invitation to join our Slack, our GitHub. And I will also send you uh, the link to all the different resources that uh, will be shown later on. Throughout the years, since 2005, uh, GTFS has evolved quite a lot. It grew in scope. I mentioned earlier, uh, TNCs, demand responsive uh, transit and so on. It got clarified thanks to the uh, project that started around the best practices. And there was a global improvement of the language, the consistency of the English used, for example, in the specification. Uh, we added the community added multiple extensions. Uh, for example, one I appreciate the most uh, is illustrated on your right is if uh, the vehicle are wheelchair accessible or not. Throughout the years, there was also clarification of the governance process and uh, again, best practices on understanding the specification. The community keeps on being big, keeps on being very active, uh, and we make sure that we listen to them before uh, we make any decision in our work and uh, that no discussion stay stale, even not started by us, but we make sure that we maintain this community very much alive. Main functions of uh, GTFS, have a couple of screenshots on the right. Uh, it describes the static, and current state of any transportation network. So in an app, it will uh, support real-time travel advice for travelers. 
globally, it will describe the network, the route and the stop, the schedule, the status of the network if uh, GTFS real-time is used, and any other characteristic. I will dive into that a little bit uh, later. We have seen more and more agencies and authorities using GTFS to describe their public transit services. Couple more example of how GTFS is used as a backbone in numerous app. I guess we're all familiar with that, trying to look at how to get from A to B in public transit system. Where it's used in over 1,800 system, again, not necessarily just cities, it could be wider, uh, in over 60 countries. So quite a bigger coverage uh, than GBFS because it's also uh, older, simply as that. Now, the core areas of GTFS, six core areas that represent the minimal file that you need in a GTFS feed. First, it started with that, uh, the description of the stop, the stop location. Uh, based on the stop, then the different routes. So something that is a combination of stop. Uh, you also have in GTFS schedule core areas, the agency details. Um, for example, how to phone them, the, the name, uh, the commercial uh, brand, and so on. Uh, you also have in GTFS schedule two parts that are ex basically what answered the original question of when does my bus arrive? So the calendar, which is uh, the operation calendar. So does it work on from Friday to, uh, to Sunday? Does it uh, work only on the weekdays or uh, in the summer and so on? And the stop times, when does my bus arrive? Uh, and you also have a description of trips in GTFS schedule uh, that allows you to refine the different uh, route. Uh, or for example, if you have a line that split into different uh, direction. As I said, GTFS got quite extended throughout the years. Uh, you see here different things that might uh, spark an interest to you. So description of better fares, as I said, uh, can I board uh, on a with a wheelchair or can I board with a bike? Uh, if a station has multiple entrances, uh, Translation, if you, uh, if you live in a country where you have multiple uh, official languages, uh, stop text to speech. So it's what allows a voice to tell you which, what is the next station uh, and so on. GTFS schedule as a feed is a zip file that contains a TXT file. So why TXT? In 2005, it was still and is uh, today one of the lightest format that exists to exchange data. It's easy to read and write uh, using any kind of tool or software. It could be a notepad, it could be a spreadsheet. Uh, it can also come from your operation software. Uh, it's easy to parse because it's based on uh, comma separation. And it's relatively uh, easy also uh, to generate and for a human to control it as we got more and more used uh, to CSV file. The structure of GTFS, it has a total collection of 22 files that uh, all combined can give quite a good description of your transit services, static, this one on GTFS schedule. Uh, and again, same as GBFS, some are required or not. It really depends on what you want to represent uh, and how your system is run. So for example, if you don't want to represent the fair information, you will not need the file, the endpoint uh, relating to fares. Tools that are built for GTFS schedule, so the static part of GTFS, one of our most prized ones, our canonical validator. Uh, again, canonical because it follow the specification to the T. It's free to use, open source, but also expandable. It is uh, very much the result of community contribution. Uh, people gave us pieces of code actually that we, was put together and it's today maintained by the same community also with the support of Google and so on. Current version, version 4.0, uh, and it has a desktop app, GitHub for a command line that uh, you can integrate in your, on your data pipeline. 
Now, if we move to the real-time information part of it, dynamic, GTFS real-time was created to answer four main use cases. The trip updates. Uh, so for example, you stand at the bus station, the bus is delayed due to traffic jam. You can see the minute change from next in five, next in 10, next in 15, and so on. The localization of vehicle that some would say is the best way to reduce anxiety of the travelers because everyone got used in looking at the map, where is the bus? And it is sometimes better information in the sense that it reassures uh, your riders better than the trip updates because they get a better idea on the map than looking at a time. Service changes, for example, uh, if a line is canceled due to I don't know, a snowfall or uh, unfortunately uh, throughout COVID, some lines had to be canceled because uh, they, there were no bus driver or simply because there was no uh, public transit system in that area. Uh, service alert, it's used a lot in France. I don't know if you all know that our national sport is actually to strike and protest. So you will have a lot of pop-ups uh, in the metro saying, for now, that station is not uh, available because everyone is standing out of the station protesting for something. So GTFS real time, how is it written? Because it's real time information, it cannot be TXT file. It uses protocol buffers. What is it? Uh, protocol buffers is a compact binary representation of a data that is already structured. So why binary? Because it's fast and efficient to process. Uh, and what I mean by structured data is something that comes from a programming piece of code, a software, and so on. So it can come directly from your uh, management uh, software for uh, public transit operation. It's language neutral, platform neutral, and extensible. So you have here, for example, example of programming programming code that totally compatible with a protocol buffer and can be converted. Uh, as of today, protocol buffers support Java, Python, Objective-C, and C++. What is the structure of uh, GTFS real-time? It has three type of feed entity, trip update, service alert, vehicle position. Uh, all of this will give the user a better idea of the current state of your real-time information, um, or the current state, sorry, of your public transit service in real-time. Again, it's not exactly real-time, like not to the second, uh, but usually we consider that if it's less than 15 seconds or 30 seconds, it's uh, good enough to reduce the global anxiety level of the riders. And some are required and some are not. So for example, if you only focus on vehicle position, you don't need the trip updates and service alert. So it's easier to be processed. Build for GTFS real time, open source tools, uh, same as for GTFS schedule, we have a canonical validator that follow the specification, free to use, open source, expandable. It was uh, originally created by the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. They donated it to us because, again, they wanted to make sure that it stays free to use and open source. And since then, we have been maintaining it. With the validator, because I said that protocol buffer is a uh, program neutral and can uh, come from different type of programming languages, the real-time bindings were created to make sure that uh, the way a programming language is uh, converted into protocol buffer is the same and consistent. So this is pre-made code uh, that help generate protocol buffer based on, for example, Java or Python. Again, uh, it follows the specification. It's free uh, to use and open source. And it was designed at the same time as a validator. So you will have the same people involved in uh, its creation uh, and maintenance today. A tool built for both GTFS schedule and GTFS real time. We have the mobility database uh, that is the giant repository where we have all the feed that exist in GTFS schedule and GTFS real time. Again, that we know of. If there is one missing, please feel free to send it to us and we'll be very happy to add it to the database. It's a community effort. It's only hosted by us. It's maintained by anyone 
who knows of a feed that exists out there. Uh, and it's actually used by 10 trip planning app, instead of going to every single website, for example, uh, of operators to get their GTFS feed, they plugged the system into the database to automatically harvest the correct link for the city they want in the uh, app. And as you can see, it's updated quite frequently. Last update was five days ago. We had an interesting question uh, from Jamie uh, saying that there are a lot of GTFS real-time feeds or for high-speed intercity train in Europe that cannot be found, do not exist. Uh, so on that one, Jamie, uh, I, I think that it's a little bit more complicated for agencies uh, running high-speed trains to actually open the data and make uh, publicly available. Uh, the chance we have in Europe is that there are delegated regulations that force the, uh, the opening of these data. So it's coming up. Uh, they were given quite a long uh, timeline to make sure that they could change the IT system, that uh, they could export whatever operating information they had in the system into GTFS real time or any other standard, Siri, for example, in the transmodal world for Europe. It's coming up. I know it's not as fast as we would have all hoped, but at least there is a regulation to um, look into. I know that, for example, in France, uh, the authority that regulates transportation systems have started to look into which one of the bigger uh, in uh, intercity high-speed train operators are not complying with the regulation, and they were going for a round of either fine or reminders that a law exists and the data should be open. So we should see it appear very soon. Uh, we have seen it appear in France three days ago. So I hope that uh, next up would be Spain, maybe Italy, uh, one of the ring country. Uh, it already exists for, I think it already exists in real time for uh, Belgium, but I'm not certain. Now, tools that were built using GTFS, so not for it, uh, but using it and not by us. Analytics, uh, one that we quite uh, like from uh, our partners at ITDP, uh, pedestrian first. So based on GTFS feed, but also other type of data like demographics, they actually offer a view on how far is a person on average from a public transit service. Uh, is it walkable or not for them? Uh, another of our member transit center came up with an equity dashboard. So the repartition of public transit offers based on the type of uh, the population living in some neighborhood. All of this using GTFS feed, but not only, uh, or you need to cross it with other type of data to build this. Any question on GTFS? Yes, Paul, uh, a zip file within zip file in the case of DOT. Unfortunately, we have seen it a lot also in other uh, regions of the world. It's not really a best practice. I can understand why it's more practical, but uh, it, it does uh, make it a little bit harder for people to consume it, unfortunately. So if uh, no more question, a little bit of how you can get involved. So I've been talking a lot. I've uh, mentioned a little bit who we are, mobility data. So just to make sure that we are on the same terms here, we are a nonprofit organization with two headquarters, Canada and Paris. And why we are hosting webinars like the one today is we really want to make sure that people standardize their data, that the data is of high quality and they share the data using the specification, the standard that exists out there. That's all we want. And as I said, we steward uh, some specification and develop open source tools. These are an, our product and it's a good segue to your question, Paul. Uh, this, catalog I refer to is the uh, 
new version, let's say, of the update of transitfeeds.com. Uh, uh, so transit feeds became stale. The uh, programming code wasn't maintainable. So we went for something easier. Uh, the database, because it exports in CSV, so people can actually ingest it directly. And we are looking into building an API that would be uh, more robust than the one that existed before. So yes, people will have something equivalent and hopefully better and faster than transit feed in the past. Uh, and mobility data, how are we governed? So we have members, some are voting or not, depending on their choice of, of membership. The voting members elect our board of directors that appoint our executive director that do all of the hiring. We started uh, within the Rocky Mountain uh, Institute project, GTFS best practice. And as I said, 2019 is when we got incorporated. We kept on growing earlier this year. Uh, we got the official recognition of an international organization and we hosted our first international event. We will host another one in 2023. I will keep you posted. I hope to see you there. Our entire ecosystem, so we have voting members and non-voting members, as I said, that are all within the ecosystem of data producers and consumers and the global mobility industry. As of today, you can see on the map some of uh, our members, uh, where they are, we're trying to expand our footprint, uh, might not get to uh, Iceland or Greenland, but we'll see that. As a nonprofit, we get often asked, how, is, how are we funded? So three main pillars, the membership, uh, sponsorship, and grants, uh, that all of these combined allow us to maintain the work on the specification, to do some advocacy work, so standardization, data quality, data sharing. We keep on repeating it from one conference to the other. Um, we give support in policy for standardization. We have projects around data quality. We maintain the tools that I presented uh, to you earlier, and we extend them. How you can get involved, two ways. First, and it's a global request, if you're a data producer, make sure the data you produce is standardized and publish it. Make it publicly available so people can have access to it. If you're a data consumer, please consume data that is already standardized. Do not create an additional burden for data producers. If you believe in it, support open data initiatives wherever they exist uh, around you, spread the word around it. Obviously open data for data that is not sensitive. And you can always join all the conversations on Slack, GitHub, send us an email. We need insight, we need input. We wanna hear from you. Anything you wanna say, anything you need is always welcome. You can also join our network and become members. I know some of you might uh, be members already, uh, and it will allow you to get access to all our resources, gain visibility, but more importantly, guide our work. Our membership program is quite detailed, so you will have the link to have, uh, to have it. One of the things we do for our members, for example, is a monthly event where they can ask us questions, we give them updates on their work, and uh, so on. To answer to your questions, uh, GTFS and GBFS are the two primary specifications we support. Yes, as of today, uh, we might extend. So for example, uh, when I was referring earlier to uh, taxis and TNCs and demand responsive transit, using GTFS, we created an extension that is called GTFS on demand to represent the services. But we know that for on-demand services, we need accurate pricing. So more like an API this time, because it needs to have a back and forth of information sharing. And we need to facilitate booking and payment, which is a little bit different if you book a taxi, a TNC service, or even a demand responsive transit than just boarding onto a bus or a tram or a train. So we're still discussing how we can manage to do the accurate pricing, booking, and payment. We are looking into the TOMP API uh, that comes from the Netherlands and Europe that I mentioned earlier. We might uh, support them in uh, becoming uh, a host, uh, or at least they have our full support. We sit uh, on their committee for change. 
as for now, it's that's it for mobility services and traveler information. We do not intend, for example, to go into operational information uh, or anything that uh, will not be traveler facing. Part of our advocate uh, work with my colleague Gretchen, we are part of a lot of different conferences, roundtable discussions happening all around the world. If you go to our website, you will see the list of all the upcoming events. Uh, we also have a public calendar. Whenever you are in town attending a conference, feel free to ping us. We will always answer your question. And I think with that, if you are near your lunchtime, please enjoy lunch. If your evening, please enjoy uh, a cocktail, a drink, a fruit juice. If it's early in the morning, please have a coffee. And we hope to see you very soon in the ecosystem in, uh, and at a conference, at a members event. Once again, thank you for attending today. And if you have questions, you can always reach us. Thank you.